Good morning and uh, welcome to this webinar on Excel here to stay or gone tomorrow. My name is Andrew Hubbard and I'm Editor-in-Chief of Taxation Magazine. In a moment I'll introduce you to our panel today but just a, a brief word about what we're trying to do here. So this is a debate really about the future of the digital tax regime and its implications for tax professionals. We want to look at the extent to which this is a matter of when rather than if. We want to have a look at the strengths and weaknesses of spreadsheets in a digital world and the inevitability that there will be change. I'm no expert in this area. I've been using spreadsheets all my professional life. I go back as far as VisiCalc. I trained on Lotus 123 and it's rip off as easy as, but I've never been an expert. I can just about use it to uh, add up columns of figures, but beyond that, I don't have the ability. But what I do have is the interest in the role of tax, uh, tax technology, um, and the readership of taxation has always been very interested in the limits of tax technology, how it can help, and frankly, how it can get in the way. So we should be having an interesting discussion here. It's going to be very participative. Uh, throughout the event, there will be a number of polls that we can ask you to contribute. If you look on your screen at the moment, you'll see on the left-hand side, there's a box for polls. At various times during the day, uh, we will uh, ask you to respond to polls. There's also an opportunity to ask questions, and we will try and weave in as many of the answers to those questions during the event. So let me introduce our panelists. First of all, we have Juliet Bailey, who's a VAT partner at Mazars, Ian Bowden, who's a partner and head of tax technology at BDO, and Russell Gammon, who's chief information officer at Tax Systems. So in order to get things going, I'm asking uh, Russell if he could uh, give us a brief presentation on the position as he sees it at the moment, where we are on spreadsheets and where it's likely to go. So, Russell, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, as, as Andrew said, um, I head up innovation um, at Tax System, so in charge of um, lots of technology moving towards the cloud and what we're kind of building both on that and CT and, and other areas. So um, uh, I'm just gonna run through some slides just for 10 or 15 minutes, trying not to take up too much time. So if we can get the, uh, the slides on screen. Um, uh, what I'll do is I'll start with kind of where we are today and why I believe there's a, a pretty compelling business case as to um, you know why the tax technology revolution is, is a matter of, of, of when and not if and kind of talking a bit about how we're progressing on that journey. Uh, then talking about the case for spreadsheets, um, where, where absolutely there's, there's Excel feature um, in, in VAT and broad, more broadly across other taxes, but certainly where, where should that play its part? Um, and then also the, the case against why why are we seeing uh, the reduction of spreadsheets in, in kind of tax processes? So. Um, some of these will be you know, moving on in terms of Chris Whitty style, so if we can uh, move to the next slide. Um, I'll start kind of just setting the scene really, talking around kind of um, uh, firstly some kind of global aspects where, where we're moving at the most broad kind of macro level. Then talking around finance functions, there's been a lot of change that's kind of happened in finance functions in the last year or two and, and kind of on an ongoing basis. And then focusing a bit on tax, so what are we seeing in, in tax functions? Um, so on the next slide, um, <clears throat> none of this will be particularly surprising to any of you. Um, you know, we are absolutely moving towards cloud. If you look at um, just some of the stats, um, software as a service, um, so cloud kind of business revenue um, is has more doubled in the last three years, and that's in the UK alone, and that's a, you know, a broad broad theme uh, globally as well. Um, the, the next stat I thought was really interesting, because this was actually even more than I um, thought it would be, but the predictions are that 94% of workload in 2021 will be processed in the cloud. And you know, part of that is, absolutely driven by having to work from home and uh, and COVID, but fundamentally there's, a, there's been a, an absolutely massive shift towards cloud and where, and where people are actually doing their data processing. And then of course, um, you know, Microsoft Teams or um, Zoom or, or others will all have pretty similar stats, but certainly um, the explosion of Microsoft Teams has been uh, well documented, you know, in that, in that two or three week period uh, back when the, the pandemic first hit, we saw a massive adoption of Teams and then the numbers continue to grow. So that's kind of a trend that um, is there and is there to stay. So uh, moving on to the, the next slide. Now, this is always one that I, I like to put up on screen because I think it's really interesting. Um, you know, and it, it's not necessarily something we think about all that often, but if we look at what people have been using the internet for, um, when you when you look for kind of cheap versus best, when the internet first came around, it was all about, you know, what can I get for cheap? How can I save a bit of money? 
Um, but now, over over the course of those kind of uh, 15 years or so, we've seen a massive adoption of, of people putting significantly more trust in technology and significantly more trust in the internet as internet has become absolutely part of of the day job. Um, so that's you know something where it, it's really uh, you know been adopted, and I think that kind of drives through now well into business. Um, if we move on then um, to the next slide and we start talking about well, what's, what's happening within finance functions, and again, there's there are a whole host of trends that are happening in finance functions that would take quite a lot longer than two or three minutes to discuss. But I think this for me was the one visual that really pulled it out is that if you look at the kind of traditional finance function, it was, um, you know, if you look at the workloads, it's very heavily kind of data processing and reporting and compliance driven with very little kind of at the top. And I think the phrase that started to be used in the last year or so is this kind of what's called flipping the pyramid, which is, you know, ultimately spending a lot less time doing the kind of the low level stuff um, and using technology to really automate a lot of that stuff and actually having the finance function spending much more of their time as that kind of strategic business partner, um, providing a lot more insight and action rather than spending um, the majority of their time just you know producing numbers. I think that's a, a general trend that's happening across finance, which of course then fills, uh, kind of feeds its way into tax. Um, and then talking about tax specifically, if we just go um, to the next slide, then what we kind of find within tax, and there's a few um, different areas, and these are a couple of studies, one from PwC and another one from McKinsey. And on the left, um, you know, what, P what PwC found was that the tax um, and tax accounting was, was quite high up on the kind of finance hit list. There's quite a big opportunity within tax to automate. Um, and on the right-hand side, um, you can see as well, you've got, you know, what, what McKinsey are kind of saying is that um, of the tasks, 38% of the tasks currently performed in tax functions are fully automatable and another 19% are kind of highly automatable, which kind of leads you to believe that, that within tax there is a big opportunity here um, for technology to kind of automate. So this is some, kind of some of the more scene setting stuff. And then if we just move forward, um, one of the things I think we'll probably talk about in the debate is I think one of the things, again, that's happening within tax that we've noticed over the last uh, one or two years is that traditional tax tended to operate on this kind of in-source or outsource model. It's a very binary yes or no, um, but we're seeing a lot more um, of this kind of co-sourcing, which is almost, um, in my first draft of the slides, I had a picture of Mr. Muscle, it's kind of, you know, he loves the jobs you hate, it's almost the kind of, you know, do the bits that you want to do or you're best at doing and then outsource the bits that you don't, but ultimately, technology is starting to enable this co-sourcing world in a much more um, kind of strategic way, so that's definitely something that's playing in. So I guess, just to summarise up, um, and again, these topics we could talk about for ages, if we, if we move to the final kind of, the next slide, just summarizing these, you'll see that there's a few different areas. If you look at the kind of the wider economy, um, you know, cloud is kind of, is, is absolutely at the fore now. Um, in finance, that kind of flipping the pyramid is happening. There's also a, a big demand for digital skills. If we look at some of the stats around um, what employers are looking for in their employees, there's a lot of demand for not any more just, you know, purely things such as, um, you know, spreadsheet abilities, but also um, automation, um, Power BI, things of that nature, you know, analytics. There's a lot of uh, demand in finance for, for skills over and above what um, we kind of see traditionally. And then within tax, of course, um, tax is, uh, is a function within a business that is ripe for automation. Um, and we've got those kind of operating models that are changing. So that's kind of my uh, five minute summary of why I believe it's kind of a when not if. And of course, this is something we will absolutely be uh, discussing more. And of course, absolutely welcome um, questions in the in the chat and as Andrew said if you put those questions in Q&A we will pick them up and um, it's always better to have a, a lively discussion around something that's been thrown at us. Um, so moving on then, um, moving on to kind of Excel um, and the case for uh, the case for spreadsheets um, and it's always a bit of a funny one of course I, I, I work for a software vendor I'm meant to hate Excel and tell everyone that you can't use Excel anymore and it's rubbish and, and that's actually not the case um, but uh, it certainly, I think, in my view, it kind of has a, a time and a place. So if, on the next slide, I'll kind of give you an over, overview of uh, kind of what we see um, uh, from the kind of benefits of Excel. Of course, Excel's been there forever. Um, certainly, it, for, for my career, I know Andrew was talking about, I do actually remember using Lotus 123 in uh, a very, very uh, past life when I did some data entry for my dad when I was about 15. It was quite fun. Um, but ultimately, it's something it's there and it's work, it works and people get trained on it. So when you, um, you know, people in schools use Excel and then they go through and, and when they go into their, you know, they go into a, a firm, they start using Excel. It's kind of, it's, it's, you know, it's bread and butter. So, you know, absolutely, I can see why people want to continue to use Excel. It is there. And I think um, one of the things we always talk about is that kind of um, bottom, bottom left is that kind of low complexity tax. So when we talk about our business, um, when we talk about VAT, 
Um, we kind of have uh, businesses that we'll call kind of, you know, they've got simple VAT, um, simple VAT calculations, and, and they don't have, you know, complexity around, say, different ERP systems. And actually, in those instances, we, we, we see Excel as probably the right tool for them, you know, using Excel um, and using a bridging tool to get their, uh, their submission over to HMRC um, via the API. Um, so, you know, it, it certainly isn't the case that we're, we're out here saying, you know, everybody must uh, replace Excel and Excel is going to kind of wither away and die. I think what the, the case that we're trying to make is that it has it, that, that kind of time in the place. Um, so the kind of the on the on the right hand side there, you'll see that, you know, and I, I would subscribe to this. You know, for certain tasks, it will always be the quickest and easiest way. If you need to do a quick calculation, um, Excel is the, the way to do that. It's just um, I think when we talk about kind of core business processes, it's maybe not the, the best tool for that. Um, and of course, it's compliant, right? There's, you know, that, that is another um, key point. HMRC have, um, have made made sure that they've kind of been out there saying that Excel is a compliant way of doing it. So we're certainly not out here saying that MTD will uh, forbid the use of Excel. Far from it. It's simply that um, that MTD is driving people away from it as a necessity rather than um, you know a, a rule. Um, so if we then move on to the case against. Um, Case against Excel. So um, on to the next slide. There's a couple here. Um, if we if we kind of look at the direction of travel from HMRC, and I've definitely used um, this graphic before. This was taken from their annual report, um, and this is looking at the tax gap. So what, where is the tax gap coming from? And if you look at the types of tax, VAT is the second biggest type of tax. And, and the interesting part for a lot of people is that that kind of the biggest behaviour that causes uh, the tax gap is that failure to take reasonable care. So it's not kind of fraud or tax evasion is that people are fundamentally are typing, you know, wrong things into the wrong places um, or they're doing things that they, they shouldn't be doing, but not, you know, um, not on purpose. They're simply doing things by accident because, you know, the processes can be complicated and involved. Um, so it, it is a continued focus from HMRC and we can only see that kind of effort ramping one way, not another. And I think there's a few quotes there from the, on the right hand side from HMRC that, you know, they want to move to this digital um, future. So there is an absolute direction of travel um, that will drive people away from uh, from spreadsheets to kind of using uh, kind of foolproof software in that space. Um, and on the next slide, um, oh, in fact, no, we're going to do a poll first. Sorry, we're just going to do a quick poll. We can flip back one. Um, we've got the first poll. Um, so hopefully a poll question should pop up on your uh, your screen now. And I think the uh, the first question we've got is, um, you know, post COVID, um, so you know, I'm getting out of COVID now. Hopefully, um, post COVID, um, there is a strong risk um, of an aggressive HMRC audit environment. And do you agree with this? Disagree with it? With it or, or you have no no view on that particular thing? So you know, will HMRC, given that they've got to, you know, drive up um, the tax take, will they start to aggressively come after, uh, you know, businesses, or not? And I think um, we will get to see the results of those polls. Um, either now or during the Q and A. Just going to give it thirty seconds. Just on that, I, the the results are in, and eighty percent agree, twenty percent disagree. So I'm okay. very clear there. Yeah, that is quite a um, that is quite a uh, a big stat, isn't it? That you know, and I think uh, the logic is absolutely sound. Um, ultimately, that, that people, uh, you know, there is a massive uh, impact of, of COVID. That you know, it's been a very very expensive time for the government, and rightly so. But um, you know, the tax gap and thirty one billion pounds of of of, uh, of money that HMRC could go after, I think that that's an absolutely um, fair assessment, and it's it's good to see that. Um, people are, uh, are, work, uh, are assuming that that's going to come. So I think that's probably something we'll discuss in the panel um, a little bit as well, because I think that's probably quite a telling stat, so it'd be good to get um, Ian and Juliet's take on, on that particular stat as well. Um, perfect. So jumping back to the, uh, the slides then. Um, so if we move on to, uh, to the next one, um, one of the things I was keen to do is, you know, so as a business over the last 18 months or so, we've, um, we have a, a product that's been out in the market all around MTD and VAT, and what I wanted to give um, was some of the feedback. So we've done over 200 implementations now of that software um, from small businesses to large businesses, um, all UK based, all, all businesses that are being impacted by MTD. So all I wanted to do is give a bit of feedback on what we've been seeing in the market. because I thought it was important not just to talk around the rhetoric, but to talk around the, um, you know, what we're actually seeing. So looking at people's Excel processes, we, we see, and I think this was the key kind of stat, was that 50%, um, roughly 50% of the uh, processes we see do have what we would call a, a meaningful error, as in an error that um, actually causes a number in the nine box return to, to be different. 
Um, and I think that's a kind of important stat. And I think the second one is actually, you know, just, just seeing a result of all of this is that fundamentally through the, the jobs that we've been doing, people have, have found mistakes in their Excel processes. And we, we have seen people claiming um, either claiming additional money where they've, they've underclaimed or having to pay money where they've overclaimed. Um, but we have seen it. So ultimately, I think what that boils down to is fundamentally MTD and that kind of digital link process is, is working. HMRC are getting um, the, the tax right now, which I think is really important. Um, and, you know, workloads, talking to our clients, in some cases, people are spending more than 50 days of effort, um, of, of kind of days of effort in a year on, on that, which is a lot of time. And a lot of that time as well being kind of preparing data, checking data, consolidating data. Um, and therefore, you know, it kind of, that goes back to the, to the point I made at the start around uh, how tax functions are very ripe for automation. Um, we tended to see that very little was done in terms of review. There were kind of, you know, maybe a check back to the prior quarter, um, but there was a, a limited amount across our client base in terms of how much time um, they were spending reviewing. Certainly, uh, I think a lot of them would like to spend more time, but simply just didn't have it because they had to spend all that time doing the preparation. Um, Submissions were very close to deadline day, um, and, and of course, one of the things we found looking at Excel processes is that um, if HMRC did come in and do an audit, there would have been a, they would have struggled really to, to show digital links, which again, as I think quite a lot of people have moved towards software. Um, so the the second poll, um, I'm going to just ask quickly. Um, so, uh, and this is of course an anonymous poll; nobody's um, confessing to anything uh, here. But question is, um, I have total confidence that there are kind of no meaningful errors or surprises in our VAT process, so um, feel free to answer, and we promise we won't be monitoring the individual responses and coming after you if you've confessed to uh, potentially getting something wrong. So uh, feel free to answer. And hopefully the results will be in shortly. Just while we're waiting for them to come in, you, you mentioned the, the research you've done about MTD working and uh, that uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's shown errors in both ways being corrected. Have you got any sense of which way around it is? Is it, um, is it uh, produced one or the other? We've definitely seen both ways, um, for sure. Um, and we it's interesting that the, just as a perception, the largest errors seem to have been where people have overclaimed, doesn't they've now got to pay back, but we've seen a bigger volume of people underclaiming. Um, so where people have made had small amounts to, to underclaim, that's that's been kind of um, what we've seen, but bigger, we have seen a couple of uh, big errors for sure that have resulted in um, impediments back. So I'm sure HMRC would be happy with that. The results come in, and I'm not sure whether HMRC would be happy with this, but every single person that's responded has agreed that they have total confidence that there are no meaningful errors or surprises in their VAT returns. Interesting. I don't suppose that comes from any surprise that you would perhaps not want to say that there weren't, but uh, well, to show a high degree. It's a slightly loaded question, isn't it? So I certainly wasn't expecting it to necessarily uh, reflect what we see in practice, but um, it's good to know that we've got a lot of highly compliant people on the line. So that's, uh, that's excellent. Although I have um, to burst the bottle because second thoughts have come in. 20% of people have now decided, well, actually, <laughs> not quite certain. So uh, there we go. But that's still a, a good proportion, isn't it? Who, who have got confidence. Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, cool. Yeah, we'll just jump back to a couple of final slides and then really want to get into the debate because I know that I'm slightly overrunning. So if we jump on to, uh, to the next one, this is just to kind of set, you know, give the final summary of, of where we currently are. And this is what we tend to see across tax functions more broadly. Um, we tend to see that there are a lot of kind of siloed processes. So different taxes will have different processes involving different um, Excel files um, and different output formats. So there's a lot, um, there's a lot of kind of silos in there. And I think as we see that kind of digitization um, coming from HMRC, the processes will struggle to keep up because you're effectively just adding more work into each one and maybe more processes and more files. And therefore, um, you can, you know, if you look at MTD for corporation tax, for example, that's four returns a year um, rather than necessarily the currently currently the one. So this, this is a world that I think in many organizations currently exists, and it's a world I don't think will uh, will kind of keep up over time. And of course, we're not saying you need to switch everything off uh, now, but it's uh, it's a kind of direction of travel. Um, and then just on to the final slide before we get into the debate, um, just to show where I think we're kind of moving to, is more of a, uh, a kind of a, a single platform for tax, where the tax data is dealt with all in one go. 
Um, it's not necessarily dealt with, you know, corporation tax, just deal with the corporation tax data um, and VAT, just deal with the VAT data and it's totally siloed. I think you're going to see a world where that comes together a lot more because you're going to have just be doing more reporting. Um, and, you know, you, you, you need to make sure that everything's kind of tied up. Um, and then kind of bringing more into a platform. Again, technology is really enabling people to do more around kind of their operations, their analytics, their sign-offs. Um, and again, this is a topic I could spend hours and hours on, um, but I, I, I won't for today. Hopefully that's kind of set the scene um, for the, the debate ahead. So now I'll hand back to, to Andrew to kind of introduce the, uh, the debate and get Ian and Juliet's uh, views on some of this stuff. Thank you very much for that, Russell, and I'll forgive you for making me feel very old by your reference to looking at Lotus 1, 2, 3 when you were a teenager. Uh, what I found most interesting is that was the fact that you were seeing errors in both directions, um, because one of the concerns that I've always had and others have had at MTD is the, the revenues assumption that all the errors, if they're corrected, will, will work in HMRC's favour. And I think a lot of us feel that that isn't the case and it is a balance and it's good to see that evidence coming through. So we, we've set the context. Now, uh, let's open it up um, to discussion. And remember that the, uh, just a reminder, the other two members of the panel uh, are Juliet Bailey from Mazars and Ian Bowden from BDO. So uh, welcome. Let, let's, let's kick off with the first question. And, and um, Julia, maybe you want to take this one, which is about, is there going to be a risk of a divide uh, post this, that those people who are still on spreadsheets and have not got on to full accounting systems will take more, or will, will create more interest from HMRC? So is there going to be a digital divide, do you think? Yeah, so it's a really good question. And there's loads of potential here for a risk divide. I think it would need to be a little bit more sophisticated than simply, are you using an automated system or not? I think it would need to bring in a combination of the, say, use of Excel against the size of the business and the complexity of the business. Because as Russell said in his presentation, for some businesses, Excel absolutely is the right tool. So you wouldn't expect for those kind of businesses to be facing a, a higher risk profile. But, but we do, we always have as advisors, seen the HMRC find a risk in a particular area and they they focus on it and they check other taxpayers in that area so that that's very normal so whether it's specifically Excel usage or a more um, defined combination of factors is another matter um, but I think it would another question might be is that a, is that a good thing would it be um, a good thing for HMRC to focus on these businesses it could well seem like a good idea um, because arguably would a really sophisticated tax team be using Excel for a complex business? We'd hope, we'd hope not, but if they are. So I think it, it could well, the answer is yes, I think it could well create a risk divide. Yeah. Ian, what's your thinking on this one? Uh, yeah, morning Andrew, and morning everybody. Uh, I think it's a really interesting question, as, as uh, Juliet said. I think looking at this in a slightly different way, we're constantly being monitored in our daily lives, uh, particularly if you uh, live in London, um, CCTV is now the normal. And for some of us, we'll see that as intrusive, even invasive. And for others, it might provide you with that sense of security. Uh, but what about if you're starting to be monitored through your organizational data? Governments around the world are turning to technology to kind of watch, watch organizations and continuous data monitoring is, is now a thing. Um, but there's an opportunity here to embrace that and to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks. Now, I'm not saying that you can't achieve that continuous data monitoring with spreadsheets, but as someone who spends half their life talking to auditors, I'd probably find it easier to explain a number if I did have an audit trail and confidence the calculation was well understood and well established rather than a spreadsheet written by Dave who left the organization five years ago and may have taken the password with him. I think HMRC recognized that, you know, everyone said the same, HMRC recognizes that spreadsheets are part and parcel of our current process, but pe pe people realize that they are a source of risks. I think it's easier to find mistakes in spreadsheets uh, HMRC has got some quite clever spreadsheet auditing software at the moment. Um, and if you were to look at this cynically, HMRC has uh, less time and less resources. And for the first time is um, 
coming slightly more aggressively and I think it's back to Russell's uh, original question in the poll question I, I saw an example recently where um, we asked for clearance on a particular matter and for the first time ever instead of getting a straight yes or no from HMRC we were told how to do a disposal and I think HMRC is looking to be a little bit more prescriptive and it's possibly COVID related so they're telling us how things should work. Uh, that's very interesting and I, and I think that chimes in with, with quite a lot of the experience that I see. I suppose following on from the divide question is at the moment to what extent are HMRC actually aware of whether a particular business is using a spreadsheet or not if it because ultimately HMRC will just see you know the end return whatever it is. Have you got any experience of actually HMRC asking questions about whether or not spreadsheets have been used? Well let me let me have a quick stab at that one. Yeah. I, I think um, Certainly for the larger organizations that have CCMs, then absolutely they're wanting to see process flows. For the organizations to fit in with the, within the business risk review profile, absolutely HMRC is looking for process flows and looking to understand how data is moving through and what they're using in the various processes. At the, um, at the smaller end of the market, it, it's a self-certification. So in, in MTD world, you're looking to certify that you've met the digital links requirements. Now that can still be done with spreadsheets, but visibility is certainly not, is not there from HMRC's perspective in terms of what you're using to produce the numbers. But you do need to be comfortable that you're, um, you're meeting the minimum requirements. Yeah, okay. We well, mentioned digital links, so that's quite a good place to go on to my next question, which is, we, we now have digital link requirements for VAT. What was the experience of, of, of how much that has actually restricted the use of, of, of spreadsheets? Uh, Russell, do you want to, to, to pick that one up? What are you actually seeing in the marketplace? Yeah, I think, I think um, and we've touched on a, a couple of the points already, but I think um, certainly if you wind the clock back, two, three, four years, you probably only had in, in the UK, maybe 50 to 100 organizations that were using dedicated software for VAT rather than, uh, you know, rather than spreadsheets. But I think that number is now probably into the thousands comfortably people have um, have had, to, you know, for, for a variety of different reasons, have had to, uh, to push forward and, and, and implement something. So I think, you know, certainly you would you would make the case that of, the, of all of the VAT returns that are being done, and particularly by volume, if you think of the, the bigger uh, companies, uh, a lot of them are now kind of using software for this rather than uh, than using spreadsheets. And I think people have started also. I think the other point being is they've started to use spreadsheets for the right tasks rather than using spreadsheets for the entire process, kind of end to end. They've used the spreadsheets for the the, the things on the edges um, because I think there was a big perception at the start that well, if we if we if we're going to go away from spreadsheets, then we have to drop things like you know we've got a a bike scheme adjustment that gets us another, you know, three or four hundred pounds worth of VAT every quarter. Now I can't code that into my ERP and I can't code that into software. It's just too expensive. So I'll just kind of forget about it. So I think what people have done is they've taken a sensible kind of hybrid approach that says, look, we're for the main processing, for the main calculation, we'll move towards software. And of course that has meant a limiting of, of using spreadsheets, but of course they are still making those adjustments and, and rightly so via spreadsheets and just making sure that they're kind of put into the process in a compliant and a digitally linked way. And of course, making sure that the evidence is there. So should they ever kind of have to, um, you know, have a look at that through the eyes of an auditor or the eyes of HMRC, um, then they've got everything there. So I think um, there's definitely been a move towards um, using spreadsheets for the purpose that they should be used for going forward rather than using them as an kind of end-to-end -end calculation tool. That's probably what, what I would say. And um, Julia and Ian, are you seeing the same thing in your practices? Mm, I think um, around, um, yeah. Yeah, I think that the, the digital links uh, requirement really made businesses reflect on what they do to meet the VAT compliance obligations and how they do it. And so it definitely drove the direction of travel, I think. Um, but there's, there's another side to it, I suppose, which is that because you can maintain your digital links using Excel, it is possible to do it for a number of organisations. It didn't, it hasn't inevitably led to a restriction in spreadsheet use so much as opened up an opportunity and created that space in businesses to think about it. That's, that's my feeling with it. Yeah, and I, I think I'd agree. I think it, it started a debate, it started a discussion. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit older than Russell and I, I started the, uh, the MTD journey quite some time ago. Um, 
in HMRC's initial intent was to get rid of spreadsheets. And that was their first document for anybody that saw some of the early iterations of the consultation. They were looking to remove spreadsheets altogether. Now that quickly changed with all of the early consultations as the pushback was unbelievable in that type of area. Um, HMRC recognized that asking us to get rid of the spreadsheets is just a bridge too far. It's been the one constant in tax functions that I've been working in for the last 25 years. And recently they've made it abundantly clear, as Russell mentioned, that they're not anti-spreadsheets. What they're looking to ensure is that the process and controls are managed. Now, reading between the lines, it's easy to satisfy auditors and inspectors with enterprise solutions and it's definitely a direction of travel but you can still make it work with spreadsheets and, and it's people have made it work really well with the MTD journey that, that they've been on but as Juliet mentioned it, it's been interesting that people have at least started having a conversation to see where it is the right place to utilize them because there shouldn't really be multi-tenant systems that 10 20 people are using they should be something that they're using to fill a gap that's useful. I mean, could you give us, any of you, an example of, of, of where you see is a really positive role for spreadsheets in the process, say in, in the back return process, where would you see the spreadsheets are the right thing to use? I think for, for small businesses, for sole traders, yeah. Um, yeah. When, when there really is just a handful of inputs and outputs in a period, yeah. then it would seem to be overdoing it to, to move to an yeah. automated system. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen it suggested, you know, that, that perhaps if you've got a, 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 a unique partial exemption methodology or whatever, that actually if you've got a that drives that, that might still be a sensible thing to do rather than try and put that into uh, your, your, your systems. But, but that, that's, a bit, of an odd, that's a bit of an odd one because, you know, yeah. partial, exemption, partial exemption is actually a complex part. That's the main complex part for, yeah. for partially exempt yeah. businesses. That's the main complex part. Now, HMRC's kind of backed out a little bit on that one because you're absolutely yeah. right. They've said that part of it can still be done however you do it at the moment. It doesn't have to be part yeah. of the digital links and the results can be yeah. brought in and as part and parcel of it. So I think that's that's a slightly different point i think that's more around the fact that it is so complex and being able to do that bit has such a meaningful impact that it was just a bridge too far and i think hmrc recognized from their early vision in 2015 and 2014 when we started here that they couldn't get all of their ideas through and we've had a lot of change in that time we've had brexit we've had all sorts of things that have kind of gone on that's meant they've, they've watered it down but they still needed something meaningful so i think the partial exemptions of misnomer i think that was a but that was just a, a, a level of complexity. I think where the spreadsheets still play a part, you know, Juliet said, is, is, the, is your simple businesses, but it, 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 you shouldn't be using spreadsheets for calculation purposes, really. They're there at the fringes to be able to help you do some additional analysis, take some things offline. But if you're using that as driving all of your numbers, and you know, I know we're talking about VAT here, but if you look at something like your tax provision calculations and things yeah. like that, a lot of groups are still relying very heavily on those and they're doing group reporting where they're pulling in multiple countries, multiple areas, copying and pasting into spreadsheets. It's just, it's risky. And the, the, the argument is that the, the price of, and whether Russell will appreciate this or not, the, the price of software has actually come down significantly. So it's, it's more affordable than it ever was. So, you know, I, I always used to get asked the build versus buy question and now it becomes a bit of a no brainer. It's like, well, you know, the risks, building a really good spreadsheet still costs money maintaining a really good spreadsheet still really costs money and actually i might want to push that away and it was back to the outsourcing kind of point outsource what i what i could so have you had any situations where people who have perhaps reluctantly moved away from spreadsheets and then turn around and say a few months later i'm so glad i did that well yeah. i've also had the other I've, I've also had yeah. the opposite of that you know because yeah. i think i think what happens in uh, and again, uh, not not to have a go at Russell and, and, and the, the kind of the system side of things, but what the systems do really well is they give you a standard process and they give you a way of being able to do that in a repeatable way. What we're used to as tax practitioners is is actually doing it our own way. 
and we find our own processes and, and those types of things. So Russell Solutions out the box will work for 80, 90% of organizations without too much messing around. But there's a number of organizations that, th that, that their, their way is slightly different and they have to do it this way. And when they've gone into a transformation or a change or buying a software, they haven't necessarily looked to take advantage of what 80, 90 percent of the world does and what these software solutions are pushing you down. They're trying to make the software bend and mold to how you do things. So I've had a number of groups that have put stuff in and then gone, actually, I miss my spreadsheets because I used to produce this report in this particular format. And it's when you start pushing them and asking them, well, why would you bother doing that? They don't always have an answer. A lot of the time it's historic reasons and everything else. But yeah. people have a process organizations have a process and sometimes the software doesn't fit that process perfectly and people have tried and and and, and aren't necessarily thinking about it as a, as a kind of a long-term play here because ultimately what you want to be doing is if, if i was it back in house again what i'd be wanting to do is take advantage of the r d money that russell and his firm put into these types of things i don't want to be spending millions on software solutions myself and I want to, if, if they're doing something clever or somebody else is innovating, I want to take advantage of that innovation so my process can improve. But if I butcher it so much and make it so personal to me, I can never get off that version that I'm on. Okay, very interesting. I, I must give you an update on the poll uh, because I don't know if it's a result of what we've been saying, but now it's now only two thirds of people agree of the that their, their, their systems are perfect and one third are saying no. So I don't know if we go on for too long, nobody will actually have any confidence in their back systems. But let's just move it on a little bit. There's sort of, we've talked as if there's an inevitability about all of this. Um, do, you, do you think ultimately that spreadsheets uh, will disappear from the system? And um, there's an opportunity here for you to contribute to the poll on this. So while you're listening to this, uh, this response is perhaps you can have a look at the poll question but is it inevitable that we will move away from spreadsheets Juliet, do you want to pick that one up yeah absolutely um i do think it's inevitable that there'll be a move away i don't think that's the same as saying there'll be um an absolute you know loss of the use of spreadsheets i think there will always be a place for them i think with with risk as the main driver and the potential for increased scrutiny from HMRC, it's really going yeah. to drive businesses towards automation. And, and I think we have to bear in mind the wider context that automation isn't new to most businesses. Um, and typically there is a desire to reduce human intervention, reduce error and increase automation. Um, and so in this case, we can see a process that can be made easier and it can be made less risky through automation. So it seems to be a win-win for businesses of, of the right size, the right sophistication. Um, so yeah, I think there will inevitably be a move away. And um, I think tax experts within businesses are going to have more time um, available to work on the really important risk areas of their businesses by yeah. being able to reduce their compliance time. And I think that must be a key driver as well for in-house tax teams to to free up the time to what they can do best rather than to have so much time taken up with manual processes. Okay. Russell, in, in, in your world, do you see this as an inevitability of moving away from I, I think I do. I mean, I, I'm slightly biased because I work for a, a technology <laughs> software vendor. So um, I, I have a, a, an absolute bias on that one. But I think, um, I think yeah, we, we're absolutely seeing that. I think uh, if, if you look at, you know, you can talk back to sort of 2014, 2015 when MTD began, if you now talk, so uh, you can now see that HMRC last year published their kind of 10 year digital strategy. And more recently, we've seen kind of consultations um, that kind of go a bit further as well. You know, ultimately, HMRC are on a direction of travel um, and, and, and arguably they are behind. If you look at the VAT process, actually, digital links and an API is, is significantly behind other countries. If you look at you know, Estonia as a as the kind of poster boy for all of this, that's total full 100 percent e-invoicing. So they were at the end, the end of, of the scale and we're quite a bit further back, but HMRC have made it very publicly um, publicly known that they are moving um, along this journey. And I think uh, what that will mean is that people will need to kind of keep pace with it. One of the, the stats, um, if, you know, again, if you look back to HMRC's annual report, you will see they, they publish their stats on how much of an increased tax yield they're getting year on year from their efforts to, you know, things like audits and, um, and things like um, MTD. 
if you look, the, the interesting stat I saw actually came from Ireland, where they've um, pointed to technology, the regulator in Ireland pointed to technology that says um, over the last two or three years, the number of audits that they've been doing, um, performing on firms has gone down by nearly 50%, but the yield of additional tax has um, actually gone up by about 30%. And the reason for that is technology. They're, they're much more able to target their audits at uh, businesses where they think there are more likely to be errors. And I think HMRC are absolutely going along that route. So very long-winded way of saying that I think HMRC and, and Ian made the point a little bit earlier are definitely getting smarter. Um, and with that, they will go and target the organizations where they think they will find mistakes. Um, and, and typically, um, they, you know, and, and this is a, absolutely a broad brush statement, but typically they'll be the ones where they're using Excel um, more prevalently, particularly for the calculations. So I, I think there is an inevitability, yes. Okay. So if we're looking at the benefits of, of moving away from Excel into uh, more systems based, and this picks up with the, the poll question. I think there are there are a number of, of possible benefits, but, but I think if you like it, them, you could say cost savings, freeing up time for more value-add activity, greater confidence in the numbers, uh, reduced risk of HMRC audit. And I'm sure you'll say all of those will be of a significant benefit, but if you just had to pick one, which would it be? Um, Ian, do you want to kick up on that one? Yeah, I don't think we're going to see anything that's hugely surprising here uh, for, for this one. I think pe people are people understand th these types of situations. I think when you're looking at the strengths and weaknesses, y you're you're looking at it from a risk perspective. You, you know, you're looking at how do you manage the risk. That's where HMRC is going. That's more around the um, the long-term vision about self-certification and all of that side of things. So you know. We're familiar with spreadsheets, we grew up with them, they're flexible, they're easy to use, they're cheap, they're free. You know, we know what we're doing, the weaknesses, they're not multi-tenanted, size becomes an issue, and flexibility is their weakness. So when you look at what's, for, for me, it's all about risk. Um, are you comfortable that what you're running, is that putting the business in the right position in the right place? Juliet, from your perspective, biggest benefit? Yeah, I was well, I was thinking um, at the start of this morning, definitely it's about greater confidence in the numbers. And then when we had yeah. the first poll result saying that people were 100% confident, so I did almost yeah. fall off my perch. Um, but yeah. I think the poll numbers have evolved, as we said. So I think yeah. I'll stick to greater confidence in the numbers as that's evolved uh, on the poll. Yeah. I did find 100% a bit of a surprise. <laughs> yeah. I think maybe those with more confidence were quicker to respond. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the the, uh, the initial findings from the poll um, at the moment say that that, that it's sixty seven percent in favour of saying that the greatest thing will be uh, the ability to submit returns earlier and free up time for more value add activity, and only thirty three saying that the cost saving. But it's it's about it seems to be about time, uh, which is perhaps an interesting one because I thought maybe it would be more about confidence, but. As we've seen from these polls, uh, people do slightly change their their minds. But um, let's move on because there's lots of lots of things that we want to do. We we, we are running out of time, but it's been very interesting um, interesting process here. So, and this is another poll question: What are the biggest constraints from moving away from spreadsheets to using specialist software? And, and some of the suggestions might be like a senior buy-in budget. And, and I think particularly if it ain't broke, why fix it? So, so what, what are your thoughts about the, 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 the barriers to this? I don't know who wants to pick up this one. Russell, do you want to pick up this? Yeah, and I think it, there, it, it absolutely, you know, it's, uh, the answer to most of these questions is slightly, it depends, and it will depend on the particular um, organization. I think we, we are seeing in a lot of instances um, Businesses having to to show more in terms of ROI, you know, what you know, what find the, the vendors or the, the whoever it might be, I mean, saying it's going to cost us X. Well, what are we going to get back? Because um, you know, freeing up people's time is absolutely the, you know one of the key drivers, as Juliet was talking about. But how do you quantify that in terms of time? Are we you know are we freeing up this much time or that much time, and what does that actually mean? Um, so I think certainly uh, there is a, a budgetary constraint that we tend to see. Um, and kind of showing up the chain to your, you know, FDCFO that you know you want to spend this money, but you're going to get money back. Um, 
we are we're seeing that happen kind of more often you know that kind of classic business casing and something we've been doing a lot more with um with our clients is to help them on that kind of process to say you know this is why it's valuable and actually put some numbers behind this rather than trying to make the arguments um more kind of uh qualitatively rather than quantitatively so i think that's a that's an important thing for me anyway okay, i think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one isn't it because uh, b business cases for some of these things it isn't just going to be replacing an individual because a lot of lot of organizations have really really small tax functions having to do a lot more anyway and having to produce an roi number that says i can cut heads or i can do something meaningful in that area isn't isn't going to cut it i think what mtd for vat did and i expect it'll be the same for income tax and for corporate taxes as well is that reg regulation forced us to do something and that's that inevitability of having to do something made that organizations were able to look and i think tax functions don't aren't always great at raising their hands and saying what their problems are i think what tax functions are wonderful at is getting on and doing making it work in spite of the processes in spite of the data in spite of everything else and doing a fabulous job of of keeping compliant and making it happen but it could be easier. There's an easier way of doing some of these things, but it's difficult with the business cases. And I do empathize most of the time we are, we are battling budget constraints. We are battling other priorities within the organization. And as a back office function, it's wonderful to be able to say that, sorry about that noise. It's, it's interesting to be able to say that, um, you know, we can free up more time and add more value, but it doesn't always have a, a pound value associated with that. So I think that's the challenge. I think for me, risk is, a, is an important play. Again, that's difficult to quantify, but back to the point I made a, a little bit earlier, the cost of some of these enterprise systems has dropped and therefore there is a, the build versus buy debate is easier to have now. If you can get the business case, if you can get the hearts and minds over the line, then it is certainly worth looking at what's out there and what's available. And some of them don't, you know, they don't have to be hugely expensive and it doesn't have to be hugely transformational. But there is some some good options if you look a bit holistically at it. Okay, let's let's now just uh, pick up a few of the points that have been raised in the questions, and, and I'll pull some of them together. But there are several questions around smaller businesses. Do they do they continue to use spreadsheet what happens to people using manual records who haven't even got onto spreadsheet are they going to just have to cease business will we, we we've talked because of 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 really part of the audience here about larger businesses but what's your perspective of this from the small business you know the local plumber or something anyone want to pick up on that one because i think that's the most difficult area in all of this juliet do you want to Oh, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So there's a bit of interference in the light. The, the, the small business context in all of this. Um, I think that's a, a point that we sort of made at the start that for some small businesses, yeah. Excel will be absolutely the right tool for them. Um, I think yeah. you, you made a comment about businesses that are maybe in a very much older mindset, still using manual processes. Well, I think yeah. there really already is a need for them to move from very manual paper-based processes to at least Excel. Yeah. Uh, and so this should maybe expedite that. Um, but yeah. I don't see, I think really for, for smaller, less complex businesses, I don't see that it should become such a, a problem or an event even, but it will spark a debate. And it should also spark um, some, some long-term strategic thinking about the direction of travel of the business, where you want to get to, and whether you are ready in how you work today for the tomorrow that you want. So it may be that automation is still better given your prospects. I think, I think there's, there's another side to that as well. I think if you're a, if 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 you're Bob the Builder and you've got a, you know a, a very small building firm or a very you know owner managed, I think traditionally what a lot of them have done or have have your, your bank account your personal bank account and your business bank account were one in the same and i think where people like hmrc are going is there's going to be more nudges as they call them in terms of suggesting that we should be doing something different or suggesting we should be doing a certain way so i think the days of having your personal bank account and your business bank account as being one in the same should be gone because there needs to be that separation 
between personal and the business side of things. I think it will spark a debate as well around some of this is um, is, is too complex or a bit too much of a pain. So Russell, one of Russell's original slides was the, the outsourcing, co-sourcing, um, in-house type activities. I think it's going to push a lot more people to the local high street accountants and get them to take the pain away and get them to do things that you perhaps might have done themselves. So I think there's going to be an increase in in outsourcing, even for the small sides of things, particularly as MTD picks up in other areas as well, and people are nervous about it. Even though there's been a few kind of really good entry level products like the Zeros of this world and QuickBooks and all of those type of um, systems that you can get on a software as a service type basis back to the cloud point, be able to utilize and do some of the things themselves. I think for the very, very smallest organizations, they may well start looking at what the value of a local accountant or a high street accountant is and, and and hopefully they'll be able to take advantage of the technology and do it more effectively and cost effectively for your for their clients as well but it's good i think it's going to stop people doing it themselves i think is my sense yeah okay uh just um we're, we're running out of time now but i just one poll result and then one final question so the result about um the uh barriers uh 20 percent lack of senior support 40 percent if it ain't broke and uh 40 percent saying uh why not have it just a single enterprise system so quite a balanced one there i want to ask one final question which is which is right at the other end of the scale which is which is this question of how long will it be before the uk has the detailed saft system which is being rolled out across europe is mtd a weak attempt at this and I think that that's an interesting question because actually, although we've struggled with MTD for a while, what we've got is actually quite, I think, uh, limited in its scope. And if you look at what's happened in other jurisdictions where there's much more uh, almost daily inter uh, electronic interchange between the revenue authorities and business, where do you think it's going to go in the UK and where would you like it to go? Uh, and this is your final question. So. Uh, Russell, do you want to start? Sure, yeah, I think, I think it's a really interesting one. It will be really, really interesting to see where they go. And um, as Ian said, you know, from the start of kind of MTD for VAT to, to now, there was a significant watering down of the, the standards, right? There was the, the original standard as it came out was, was, was deemed to be pretty harsh, and then um, a lot of feedback and it got pushed back. The thing that to me will be really interesting to see in the kind of the next big acid test we've got of this is around MTD for CT because the consultation came out, and we'll find out next year what, what, the watering down process for MTD for CT looks like. Now, my perception is that uh, HMRC might stick closer to their guns. I'm sure that things will change because that's the part of the consultation process. But, um, you know, if MTD for CT came in as it is in the original consultation, that is a material change to the way the tax functions have to operate. Um, so it will be interesting to see that's, that's when we'll next see if HMRC are going to toughen their stance. And if they do, then I think we're more likely to see them going further on MTD for that. They've certainly left the door open on MTD for that, but they've sim they've also said that you know they need time for it to bed in. They need time for to to monitor the success. We've got income tax coming, um, so I don't think it's you know we're not going to see a, a safety regime anytime in the next you know two or three years. I just don't think that's realistic. Um, but it will be. We'll kind of have some signposts along the way, and I think next year for me is that real key signpost to see if HMRC are going to. Um, stick closer to their original mandate on MTD for CT. So I think it's a bit of watch this space. Juliet? Mm -hmm. um, interesting what Russell says, and uh, I agree. I think an additional point is that would HMRC have the capability to, to digest the data they could be getting? So that's, that was a question right at the start with MTD, that HMRC can request information in a certain form, but have they got the capability themselves to analyse it? And I think that question becomes even more important when you look at progression, real-time invoicing, real-time VAT accounting, that it'd be, it'd be a, a sort of very good long-term journey to have in the UK tax system. I think it's a, a very long way off, um, partly through sort of natural cynicism and partly through our experience of MTD and how it's rolled out. Okay, and uh, yeah, if final word on this from Ian. So I was just going to say, yeah. no, go for it, Ian. Sorry, Sorry Russell, go far away. No, I was just going to say, as a, as a, just as a final follow-up to Juliet's point, I think 
part of that comes from the rollout of IXBRL. You know, they bought IXBRL out in 2009, 2010, and I think the perception of that is that that just has failed and hasn't delivered HMRC the kind of value. So I think that's we've got this cynicism from, but we'll be interested to see where it goes. Yeah, but the, the, interesting yeah. on the IXBRL, for the first time, we are seeing audits being raised on the back of IXBRL data. The last two years has been a shift change. They have invested heavily in that data mining. They are looking at automation. So if you look behind the curtain at HMRC, yeah, there's a lot of paddling going on there, but they are finally starting to utilize that data. But Juliet's point is hugely valid. The volume of data that they could get in this type of regime is off the chart. And I think it, it's back to the philosophy here, you know, without putting it down HMRC isn't looking to be at the bleeding edge whatever they publish and whatever they say they have followed other regimes quite closely monitored how it's worked if you look at how HMRC has evolved over the years to look at how it pans out in other jurisdictions you look at where we got income tax and everything else from a lot of it's from New Zealand and places like that we'll see how it forms and establishes and then they'll look to adapt it and tweak it for the UK they wanted data they wanted volumes of data but you know Juliet points right they didn't have the capability to analyze that and do anything with it so it's going to be quite a while before an sft kind of regime is here there is nothing on the immediate roadmap for vat for the next five or six years in terms of having those kind of real times hmrc is monitoring the situation in other jurisdictions seeing how that is evolving and seeing if there's anything they can borrow from that they have got an aspiration to be digitally enabled but you know it, it's about receiving the data that, and they're, they're just not quite um, willing to push it because realistically the UK has to be seen as being open and easy to be a place to do business and come to we're still selling ourselves on a global market more so than ever uh, from an economic perspective and we want to be seen as a place where businesses can come and thrive and invest in and everything else and if we've got tax systems that are difficult and we look at where things like SAFT have been successful it's been where the tax gap has been even larger than our perceived tax gap here so people have had to take quite significant steps in certain jurisdictions to get it to probably where we are already we've got a regime that is a little bit more around self-certification a little bit more about governance and controls and policies i expect the governance and controls and policies will will continue to increase uh, there will be more and yes we will want more data from hmrc but it's going to be the other territories so any businesses that are in multiple jurisdictions they'll have to get used to doing these things in other territories before you get them in the uk Okay, thanks for that. Well, I think that more or less wraps it up. I've, it's been a very interesting debate for me, as, and I've followed some of this for a very long time, like others. It seems to me that, that we are on a journey, and I think the journey was a, a pretty rocky start uh, for HMRC because I think their plans for MTD were wildly too ambitious. What I think is interesting is that the COVID crisis has actually given HMRC a greater confidence in its ability to deliver on major projects. And there's no doubt that they were able to deliver uh, the COVID support in a way that perhaps none of us thought they would. And I think that's greater confidence to steer ahead with future developments here. I think it will be a very long process. And I think actually there's a lot of pragmatism around um, the senior parts of HMRC, that they, they know that ultimately this is the direction of travel, that there will be more and more data interchange, that, that electronic means will be at the way going forward. And I think that they are prepared to take a reasonably long game uh, in all of this. So I think, you know, in another three years' time, if we were running the same, set, the, the same event, we would be saying some of the same things. There would be some further... Uh, changes but I think this is this is a, a journey for the long time thank you very much to all of the uh, the speakers for, for their contribution here I think it's been a fascinating debate thank you for um, the audience it's always very nerve-wracking when you're doing this thing from a computer in your uh, your own study that you don't actually know whether there is anybody out there but the fact that people have been responding to the polls and uh, people have been putting questions in uh, gives me confidence that that, that that people have stayed the course so uh, thank you very much for all your contributions uh, I will remind you that a copy of the video of the presentation uh, will be um, available uh, from Friday and also copies of the slides will be available I'm afraid it's one minute past 11, I've over allotted my time, but I hope that uh, you all found it very interesting and, and best wishes for the rest of the day, the week, the year and your careers. 
And maybe there'll become a time when you'll be talking about the fact that you, you used Excel and people will say, what was that very old fashioned thing? Did that come before or after slate pencils? So thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.